trader who has proven himself to profit over $20 million and probably one of the biggest names in the trading space. I'm a strong believer when you have a strong enough mission, the money shows up. Even if you don't want it to show up, it's going to come. Imagine you go and you're like, I want to be the best trader that can have an 80% win rate, let's just say, with a 3R multiple, whatever the case is. Imagine you hit that, well, what will happen? You will make money, simple. But if you go and you're like, well, I want to make $10 million, cool. It's not just gonna pop up here. Well, ladies and gents, we have a big one this week. Introducing Umar Ashraf, a good friend of mine, pioneer in the industry and exactly what this show is about. He is a titan of industry and he is not only a titan of today, he's a titan of tomorrow because he's only on the upward trajectory. I've had days where I've made tons of money and I've gotten purely lucky. And when I say luck, I mean in terms of there was no systematic approach to that trade. It was just something that made sense in the moment that I thought made sense. But then when I go back to it, I'm like, well, it didn't fit my game plan. It didn't fit my playbook. It didn't fit any criteria that I had. So I have to say, okay, I'll take the money, but I have to write this off as a bad trade. It's not always the real financial capital that you lose. It's the mental capital that you lose. When you have okay. such a big loss, yes, you lose the money, but alongside with the money, what else do you lose? You lose confidence. You lose your ability to execute. You lose your ability to trust your setups and trust what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is a recipe for a big, big mess. I'm by design. I've always been very lazy where in trading, I'm like, okay, well, this is working. It's refreshing find how do I make more by doing the least amount of work okay two ways Hey ladies and gents, welcome back to another episode. I'm joined by a good friend of mine and hopefully, I think this will be our best episode yet. Uh, so Umar Ashraf, you've probably seen him around, uh, taking over the internet, especially in the trading space. And he became a good friend of mine a year ago now through Riz. And Riz connected us on the round table. Uh, and then we just stayed in touch. Um, hung out often and because we've built a friendship now, I think I can get a lot out of him that he hasn't maybe said online. So that's the goal for this. But yeah, Omar, thank you very much for, for making this happen. Thank you for having me on, man. Yeah, that's why that's one of the reasons I'm excited for this pod because I go in some pods and it's a lot of repeated questions and I think people don't know the depth of questions to ask me. Mm. Uh, so I think because of our friendship in the past year, I think it'll be a fun, fun yeah. pod for sure. So what I want to do is skip the life story by now they probably know who you are and, and seen it on another bunch of podcasts. Uh, so we can skip the whole credentials, who you are, what you've done. And I want to just jump right in. Uh, first of all, let's, let, I want to do it in phases. So let's start off with your trading itself. And then obviously you have a lot of other projects in life. You've done a lot of cool things. So then we can kind of uh, direct and orientate through that. So just starting off with trading, you have probably the best reputation in the industry. And I think you've led with not just value, but also proof uh, and the example that I've seen is you want to learn something you can learn it from your economics high school teacher or you can learn it from Warren Buffett they both tell you to inv invest in SP. you want to learn from Warren Buffett and I think that's probably why your brand has grown in the way it has so I just want to hear your reflection on why you took the route to take social media up and then be as transparent as you have been and why you think others aren't doing the same as you have done I mean why others aren't doing the same I think everyone can answer that Right. That's not a, that's not a hard one to answer. But uh, my, my approach has always been, you know, if I'm talking about something, I want to showcase that I've done it. Right. Same thing. And, you know, when people talk about, oh, buy Tesla, buy Apple, buy this stock, buy that, make this investment. I think unless you have skin in the game, your opinion doesn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you come to me and you're like, hey, bro, buy this stock. And I'm like, OK, well, how much skin in the game do you have? And you own nothing. I don't really care about your opinion. Right. Same thing with if you come to me and you're mm -hmm. trying to teach me how to build a certain business, or you're trying to teach me how to you know, do something at a, at a certain scale. I want to see the proof that you've done it because anyone can read off a book and take that information or watch a YouTube video and kind of make it into their own opinions and you know way they want to teach it. But I think people that have been through actual war have the real wisdom. And mm -hmm. I want to see people that have that actual wisdom by going through war. So if I want to learn something, the first thing I look at is, all right, show me the proof. So mm -hmm. for me, for the past X amount of years, it's every year, hey, look, this is what I did every year. And, and for people that don't know, there's years that I haven't done the best compared to the year prior, right? I think in 2021, I did seven and a half. And then the year after I did under two, mm. two million in, in profits from trading. So I cut down 60, 70% the next year, but I'm still showing it because it's like, hey, this is my journey. And I'm just trying to show you guys what's happening within my journey and how trading really is. And I think if you want to build a legitimate business product service, when mm. you are raw and like real with it, people will kind of connect with you. Yeah. And we've seen your brand blow up. I think ju just in the last year was 
200K or yeah, below yeah, 200K. About, yeah, yeah. You ended the year at 600, so you tripled your audience in the space of a year. Um, and yeah, so what I, what, what I wanted to get into with the trading element was you obviously it's the stock side, whereas I'm in Forex, so there is a bit of a difference there. But um, when you were coming to learn, was there a lot of information online that you could piece together from or was the majority of your success and profitability through, you took the schools of thought information, but then you had to build your own way and navigate through experience and reps as opposed yeah. to just learning. Was, was, it the, was it the latter? Uh, I think when I first started, it was a lot of just following one person, doing what they're doing. Mm. And I think in 2013, it was a lot of penny stocks. Right, That was like the big thing, penny stocks, especially the way I was focusing on the market. So I went in, in the route of trading penny stocks, mid caps, small caps, and then doing whatever anyone on YouTube would tell me to do. Because mm -hmm. in my head, I'm like, oh, well, they're on YouTube. They have X amount of views. They mm -hmm. must know what they're talking about. Uh, over time, I've learned majority of people have no idea what they're talking about, right? They're more so YouTubers than traders. And for me to be good at this craft, I need to kind of make sense of the market. And what a lot of people talk about doesn't really make sense. And I have to put it in, I have to take theory and put it into action and kind mm -hmm. of see. So when I started doing that, I started getting my reps in. Uh, you know, there's components of the market that made sense. There's components of the market that didn't make sense. And from there it was like, okay, well, let's just try to gravitate what is working and why it's working and what's not working and why it's not working. And once I started puzzling that together, it started give me, giving me more clarity in the markets. Mm -hmm. Do you believe it's possible to just, as a newcomer, become profitable, become a trader through just online resources? Or do you think that's the beginning, but you got to also then just spend an extended period of time figuring it out yourself? I, I, think, I think no matter what course or what program you take, it can be the best trading program in the world. The best teacher you will have is experience in the markets. Yeah. Right. No, it's just it's it's a given. I like like I don't think I can ever tell anyone, hey, give me an X amount and I will make you or help you become a profitable trader. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can guide you on the proper things to focus on and the proper things not to focus on. But you still have to put the reps in like mm -hmm. I can't help you get in shape right without you going to the gym. So as a trader, you have to be on the field putting on trades because also when you put on trades with real capital, you realize so many things about yourself, mistakes that you make, fears that you have that pop up on the trading screen. Mm -hmm. And you can't learn that without you actually doing it and you putting it into action. Mm -hmm. In that process for yourself, which is probably the best part of a decade of just doing your reps, getting your own experience, what were you doing in that time frame to actually do that? Because this, this is a sentence that people say, you know, go and find your own experience. But what does that truly mean, like day to day? What are you actually doing to get that? And um, how do you navigate yourself to know you're on the right lines or not wasting time? What, what does that day to day look like of doing the reps? Sure. So early on, the reps for me would be, for example, if I'm starting a trading session, trading New York session or, you know, 9.30 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, I'm setting up game plans, just something simple as setting up game plans and what I think is going to happen in the market and why, right? And then after the session is done or I'm done trading, just going back to that game plan and looking at how the market actually, like what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Just comparing that one kind of situation day by day helped me grow, helped me learn, right? Helped me learn, oh, wow, you know, a week before big economic news is about to hit the market, we typically see flat action because big players mm -hmm. are on the sideline. Yes, yeah, someone can tell you that and explain it to you, but when you see it happen and you experience it, it sticks with you, mm -hmm. right? But the way you make it stick with you is by putting in the reps of writing those things down and then coming back to it and being actively engaged in what's happening. Mm -hmm. So doing something as small as that, uh, doing things in terms of going back to my trades and, and looking at them, right? And being honest where... I've had days where I've made tons of money and I've gotten purely lucky, like purely lucky. And when I say luck, I mean in terms of there was no systematic approach to that trade. It was just something that made sense in the moment that I thought made sense. But then when I go back to it, I'm like, well, it didn't fit my game plan. It didn't fit my playbook. It didn't fit any criteria that I had. So I essentially got lucky. So I have to say, OK, I'll take the money but I have to write this off as a bad trade. Yes. Vice yes. versa, when I have, I've had bad trades, in the moment I've gotten frustrated, I'm like, oh man, I lost money, this was a terrible trade. Mm. And then when I go back to it, I'm like, no, this wasn't a good, this wasn't a bad trade. This it was, was actually right a great do, trade, yeah. right? I have put out the risk and it didn't work out. That's the mm. market, that's what I signed up for. I am required to put out risk. I'm required to have trades that I'm gonna lose money on. I lost mm. money. 
it was the appropriate amount that I was willing to lose based on my account size, based on the trade I was taking, whatever the case is. And it just didn't work out. And there was nothing that I could do in this predicament to make it better. Mm -hmm. And I have to learn and live with that. So doing those reps, doing those things over time, they become second nature to you and you become very kind of fluid in the market, especially with your execution. Because the biggest problem I think people have is execution. They can have they can have a good roadmap, a good game plan, uh, good playbooks, good setups, everything. But when it's time to execute with real capital, they hesitate, they're scared, they double guess mm -hmm. themselves, they're overconfident, whatever the case is. So I think when you get those reps in over and over again, you kind of reduce those feelings, emotions, and, and whatnot. In this day and age, prop firms is the best opportunity for traders. But the problem with prop firms is a lot of them have major red flags, too large commission, too large spread, huge percentage gain targets. Alpha Capital, on the other hand, has some of the best trading conditions in the industry with $0 commissions, minimal slippage, very competitive spreads. And Alpha Capital is one of the few prop firms that has never denied a payout and they have a clean reputation, which is why I'm proud to be working alongside them. Using the link in the description or the code TOT, you can go ahead and get any challenge for 30% off. When it came to your last three, four years, let's say in your trading, you've publicly mentioned, I forget the numbers, but seven mil one year, two million another year. So if you can just give me a quick summary of the last three years, and I want to peg it to a question. So the last three years, roughly, what was your end of year? All three years, probably 2020, 2021, 2022, three, probably more than 15 just four years probably more. and how would that be broken down because you said one was a big year then there was less. I had I it was I think 2020 was I uh, don't quote me on the numbers but I, I'll maybe mix up a year or two I think one year was like two then one year was like 7.5 I think one year was one one four I think one was 4.4 last year was 4.4 uh, but 2020 and 2022, or maybe I mixed them. One was 1.4 and okay. one was like 2 million. I mean, regardless, big years and, and big numbers. And, and just, we, just, we for, just, just something about two of those years, right? Uh, I think it was 2020 is when I had my biggest trading loss, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was publicly as well. Uh, yeah, I had yeah. my biggest trading loss. I still closed the year out profitable uh, mm -hmm. over seven figures. So that's one. And it's not to you know brag about it or, oh my God, look. It's more so to showcase that it's not the year that I had. It's the stuff that happened within the year that as a trader, you're still able to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think the other year, which was 2022, uh, I necessarily didn't trade for majority of the year. I even okay. have like a whole thing on my Instagram. I didn't trade for half the year, mm -hmm. uh, primarily because that was the year we were building Tradezello, yeah. right? Uh, so, so that's what it was. So it, th th there were very few years where I was actively day trading every single day, every single month to month to mm -hmm. month to month. So that's why you see the big difference in 2021 to the other years. Because people ask me, well, you had such a big year in 2021 what went wrong the other one or right. two years and it's like well it I wasn't, wasn't a level wasn't level playing field in, in terms yeah. of how active i was trading it wasn't the same 2020 i was actively trading well but just that big losing month just kind of destroyed me for like four mm. or five months confidence wise so which year would you say therefore is the year you're most proud of given maybe it's not the one that you made the most money maybe it was climbing back from a big loss or i think it had to be 2020 absolutely okay. yeah because i think uh when because i've never lost that amount of money second it was public mm. right uh i shorted the market which i was up on at a point then when feds cut the rates and started pouring money into the markets for me to switch my position which is what i should have done i doubled down I was just so like, I'm going to be right. I put it out publicly mm. and every single thing I touched after I lost money on. I remember I showed it Tesla. I lost money. I showed it Zillow. I lost money on anything I touched because I was in such a mentality of the market can't go up. It has to go down. Yep. And, uh, you know, from, ment from a mental point of view, it's kind of like, oh, shit, I think I'm about to have my first red year. This was like in May of 2020. I was like, mm. oh, I'm going to have my first red year. And then it went into, well, do I not know how to trade this market? Because, you know, you start listening to what people are saying. The comments, yeah. People are like, oh, well, he's been trading a bull market for his whole life, so that's why he's been making money. And then you, you, you go, shit, wait. And then, you know, when you take a step back, you're like, well, it doesn't matter as a trader if it's a bull market or bear market because I made money both ways. Yeah. But then you still let those things start bothering you. So mm -hmm. for me to come out of that year green and not just like break even green, over seven figures green, was kind. Of, it, it gave me the confidence booster of like, okay, well, I now realize even more that this stuff happens in trading. Mm -hmm. And I realize even more that my risk has to be on top of everything because that big loss could have been avoided, 
but I let my risk go out of control because I wasn't looking at how much I'm risking. I was looking at what I could make if I'm okay. right. And yes. I was so anchored towards I'm going to be right. So the more money and more risk I put in, the more money I will make. So I factored out that I'm going to yeah. be wrong. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of just put things that I already knew in perspective like shit. This is what happens when you do that. Mm. And the biggest thing I learned from that wasn't the mental capital, right? It's not always about the, it's not, no, not meant, it's not always the real financial capital that you lose. It's the mental capital that you lose. When you have okay. such a big loss, yes, you lose the money, but alongside with the money, what else do you lose? You lose confidence. You lose your ability to execute. You lose your ability to trust your setups and trust what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So every trade afterwards, like I said, I hesitated on, Am I sure? Is it working? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, so things just got really messy. So that's why now when I look at trades, I'm like, okay, well, I'm risking 30 grand a trade. Okay, well, uh, let me not look at the trade from a perspective of, oh, I will make 90 grand or I will make 100 grand. What else will I lose if I'm wrong? And I look at every trade okay. like I am going to be wrong. So that shifted my mindset. So you, you don't consider the loss just in the dollar amount, it's the loss plus the other domino effects of the loss? It depends where I am, but yeah, okay. a lot of times, yeah. Because like if I'm doing really, really well, right? Like let's say I'm on a hot streak, uh, I, I kind of start getting more on the tip of my toes then because I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I'm on a hot streak. If I overplay my hand on the wrong spot one or two times, I don't want to give up too much profits. I don't want to mm -hmm. lose too much money. And I also don't want to immediately destroy this momentum I have. So I want to get okay. more selective because when you do really, really well as a trader, you start developing more blind spots, mm -hmm. right? And I've seen that happen. Like I've seen myself go on like a three-week winning streak and then the week after I have the worst trading week and I'm like, well, how did I even take this trade? And I realize it's those mental blind spots because you start winning for so long that you stop doing the things you were originally doing. You stop looking at trades from a different perspective. You start yes. looking like, I can't be wrong. And that's happened to me. So uh, j just kind of taking those lessons and compiling them together was, was big for me. In, in those years that you've mentioned, were you also pub as public the whole time? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask upon that element too, because you're talking about the mental real estate taken up by yeah. a loss, but then you've got a whole other cloud on top of you yeah. mentally, which is the public domain, the opinions, the comments and so forth, which is both ways probably where when you are going through the wins, you get that euphoric high of I've made profit, but then you also get the validation of the whole world saying you're a legend. So that can, that can skew that, you in that, one that, way that doesn't bother and me. the other. Wait, that, okay, that, that's, that never, that, that's never, when I was younger, sure, 22, 23. Okay. Now, I, if anyone says anything to me, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't boost up my ego at all. Like I, I, I've okay. learned to shut that off. Like I, I, like someone can come to me and say, oh, you're, you're this, you're that. I don't care. I, mm. I, I don't want to hear it. I'm, 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 it's going to go in one ear out the other. And I think you need that. Whereas previously when you were younger? It was yeah, of course. Yeah. When you know, you know, you're okay. younger, you hear things from people because it, it puts you at a point of you get very comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, it alters how you think to a certain degree especially if you're trading, you start getting comfortable, relaxed, you start going, oh, I know what I'm doing. I got mm. this down. And that is a recipe for a big, big mess. Yeah. Right. So now I don't like people say things. I'm just like, great. I, I want to tune it out. Is it easy to do that? Yeah, very easy. Because okay. also you, you have to mentally know who you're anchoring off. Because like you have to anchor off people that are at a very high level and are doing extremely well. And obviously when you get there, you then anchor off higher and higher people. And there's mm -hmm. always stages in life, right? So for me, it's always been looking at things from that perspective. Like for example, okay. when I was, I think 24, I bought a, I bought a car and people like, oh my God, you got this car. It's so great, great, great. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, it's cool, but there's people that have $60 million jets, $70 million okay. jets. And it's not the idea isn't the jet, and I'm not trying to make it all about that, but it's to anchor yourself and to keep yourself grounded at mm -hmm. what stage you're at, right? So I, I don't listen to, I don't like to listen to compliments. So, so therefore, is it easier for you now than before? Because as you've ascended in the social media sphere and you've kind of were lower down and you've worked your way up and now you're, you're you're kind of up there is it therefore the compliments or the bad comments of the people in the industry don't affect you because you've achieved what you came out to achieve yeah i mean the bad comments did affect me early on now they don't unless it's coming from someone that's doing really really well and better okay. than me sure but if you're not doing better i, I not in an egotistic way it depends on where it's coming from is it like mm -hmm healthy criticism to help me improve, which I'm open to listening to from all angles, or is mm. it pure hate? 
And most of the time, it's pure hate. And I'm like... You can't please everyone. Yeah. Exactly. So th this year, so this is coming into my eighth year. So it's not, only this year is the first time I've decided to take a similar step, which is try and put my neck on the line a little bit and, and be a bit public. Feel? So that's why I wanted to mention it is because it's actually I've been performing really well, which is kind of like could have gone either way. I could have performed really bad or really well. And as we know, your wins and losses are randomly distributed. It's not just going to be win, loss, win, loss. So I've been on, I've been on a good streak and it's so it's nicely that it's been publicly. Uh, so as we're filming now, it's week 12 and I'm up 40% on, on the public signals. A lot of people are talking about that. I remember I spoke to someone, uh, oh, yeah? they, they brought that up. They're like, yeah, yo, what he's doing on, on so live cool is, is, is cool. Yeah. So for me, it was the, the, Trading performance and the profitability was what, what I've been doing for a while. Not to that level. It's only in the last two, three years that I've got very strong. But that was always behind the scenes. So now when I'm doing it publicly, I thought probably naively that I could just keep doing it and it's not going to affect me. Um, and it hasn't affected my performance at all, which is good. But I, it's kind of like it's something I'm avoiding, but I know it's coming. Where it's, it's, I'm seeing the comments and when I'm winning a trade, the comments are sick. So then that is affecting me. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, I'm getting that approval. People see that I'm legit. I've been saying I'm legit for years and now they're seeing it. But then it happened to me where I had like, it was when I was around 35% up. I had three losses in a row. And you're the worst it's, trader. It's, it's you're the worst normal. trader in the world. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> because I get it, people are like following along. So they didn't join on day one. They've joined on week 10, week 12, whatever. So they just see me three losses in a row. So those comments, they hurt. Yeah. Like, oh, it didn't yeah. affect my trading yet, but they hurt. And then, they, yeah. then I had a trade the next day that I took myself and I didn't put it as a signal. And I was like, oh, what if it's another fourth one, whatever. But it ended up being a win, which would have covered those losses. So I can already see early on how it can cloud and affect performance. And then maybe if I'm doing this for a year, how it's going to affect other things because um, it is very sensitive. And for me, I it's annoying, but... The compliments I don't feel, but the negative I don't, I don't know why. Maybe yeah, I should feel them. How but humans the, are, yeah. the odd comment from a ghost account, I feel, and uh, they're the same thing that you said of like maybe he's right. I'm like, well, how can he be right? I've been doing this for years, but he's like, oh, you don't know how to trade. I'm like, maybe, maybe I don't. So I want, that, when you say to me that um, it doesn't affect you at all, why not? Kind of thing. What, what? It doesn't affect me at all now. That okay. that's the thing. In 2020 or 2021, maybe it affected me. Mm -hmm. That was my seventh or eighth year. I think I've I've gotten to a point now where I've kind of just been hyper focused here, and I'm like, okay, this is where I'm going. So if you think I suck at trading, then cool, I suck at trading. I don't really care. Mm. At the end of the year, when I have a PNL to post, unless you have a bigger PNL to post, your comment to me is irrelevant about mm. if I suck at trading or not. And I'm also not trading for you, and I'm not trading for you. I am trading solely for myself. So if you think I suck, then great, I mm. suck. I don't care, I'm not arguing. Now, me at 2020 was very different. Okay. It would it would mess with me in both ways, right? Uh, if some random comment on Instagram or whatever says, this guy sucks, I want to prove him wrong. Yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and it's exactly that where, you know, I, I, I traded well for X amount of time. And then when, that, when I had that bad period, I am now the worst trader in the world mm. to everyone, right? Yeah. So th th that is how people are. That's how, you know, humans yeah. are going to react, but it's, Ultimately, you have to kind of create a separation from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep doing it publicly, keep posting, but just you have to kind of put this wall up to not let the comments come in because if they start coming in yeah. and it really builds a space, and it also you have to keep in mind, you haven't had a two, three-week losing period, right? Exactly, and when it comes, which it will. So what happened was I was always then, as you say, the comments come, so I'm just jumping to defend my position. I'm like, no, you don't make sense because of X, Y, Z. So I was always just replying to these odd hate comments. And then someone just commented. He was like, what I've noticed you only reply to the negatives and all the positives you don't even reply to. So it was a bit of reality check. I was like, he's right. I'm focusing on the negative and that will breed more and, and it will just end up worse. Uh, but the reason I bring all of this up is because as you grow from year one as a trader to a decade and beyond, uh, I, it seems like in your case, it's evolved a lot, not just from mental maturity, but also the externals. So I think when everybody starts, you have a chip on your shoulder because you're doing, you're entering an industry that is non-conventional and therefore it comes with stigma. And usually parents don't support it. Friends around you are like, oh, you're trying to be some trader now. So it's always negative in the beginning. So then you therefore come with a frame of, I want to prove everyone uh, wrong. Mm -hmm. 
uh, not only yourself but also the people around you and then as you grow and you start to enjoy it and you get you know you find some profitability maybe you don't care so much about the friends opinions but you might still care about your parents opinions because they are still checking in like hey are you still you know are you still trying to for me trying to be a dentist or, or what is going on uh, and then it seems like you reach the stage where you've blocked it all out or maybe there is someone's opinion that you're still trying to maybe it's your parents maybe it's someone around you or is it just now you versus you and it's on yourself I, 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 at this current stage I, I don't think anyone I don't care about anyone's opinion uh, it, it, okay. al- it, it also comes with it doesn't just come from affirmations and you telling yourself stuff it comes with the level of success right okay like when, when you get to a level of success consistently you start having this level of belief within yourself that becomes so unshakable from the outside even within the inside someone in your family someone close to you you're like okay well this person doesn't know me then if this Mm. is what they think they don't know me but that is only that only comes when you get that success to a point where you feel very confident like even though i've had success in 2019 even though i've had success in 2018 to a certain degree i didn't feel that confident or comfortability within myself until maybe 2022 right and what what changed in that I think I think for me one thing that changes when I went back and I paused and I looked at every year I'm like well I've been profitable for seven years out of the nine ten years at that certain time and I'm like I've posted a PNL mm-hmm. people say their comments in between areas people question things okay I'll, I'll have a bad month I know I'm gonna have a bad mm-hmm. month I'll have a bad quarter but I have proven time over time that I do come out winning at the end of the year for myself, not for you. Mm-hmm. So I think that gives you a level of comfortability. Like for example, if I go and I trade live tomorrow and I'm, I'm and I trade terribly for two weeks, okay? In the back of my head, I'm like, okay, well this two week doesn't determine my whole year. Yes, yes. And I've done it for X amount of years in the past year. Mm-hmm. And then also when you get so many hate comments, cause I've gotten it from so many people, from friends, from certain family members and so on, especially in the trading world, and then you see everyone trying to do what you're doing after knocking you down. It also shows you that people's hate or people's dislike towards what you're doing isn't about you. It's more about them. Yeah. It's their lack of knowledge about what you're doing. They maybe have a bad stigma and trading does have a bad stigma, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I hate to admit it, but trading is not like I'm not proud to go out and be like, yeah, I'm a day trader. I've seen it when we go out for dinner. You yeah, know, yeah. so yeah. it's it's. It's become such a bad stigma because of how certain influencers have made it. So when people look at it like, oh, you're trying to do this scam nonsense, I get where they're coming from. So I have to accept that their opinion and point of view is only to the you know experiences they've had. Mm. So I, I just don't take it personal. And it is it is a rough road, even for you. Like I said, when you go through that two, three week uh, losing period, and it's going to happen. Everyone goes through that public losing period, right? <laughs> that's when the comments will mess with you. Mm. That's when what everyone says will put you in a, in, in a terrible state of mind. So I'm not that guy that is gonna sell out and throw promotions at you, throw this link, that link. You've never seen it from me. But TradeZeller is a little bit different. This is a journaling software that I've been using myself for about a year now. And you've seen it on my YouTube videos many, many times going back months and months. And because I'm friends with the founder, Umar, he's actually given me an exclusive offer to pass on a discount to you guys because I told him that it's a valuable gift I want to give to my audience. As a trader, it's very simple. You have to find an edge and then you have to have a mind so you can follow that edge but how do you know if you're performing correctly or not you have to know your data and TradeZeller is going to show you everything that you need beyond the surface level win rates and performance and equity curve it's going to show you detailed reports it's going to be your back testing tool strategy testing tool playbooks notes and it's going to be a full journal it makes your journaling easier faster and more meaningful whereas if you were just documenting it on an excel spreadsheet or taking screenshots on your iphone you wouldn't be able to pull out the data that you need the correlations that the ai within TradeZeller is is pulling out for you. There's so much variety and utility within the software that I think it's essential for any trader. So the link somewhere below is going to take you directly to the TradeZeller website. I'm not getting paid. This is for you. If you want it, if you like it, go ahead and explore it and probably you'll be using it for years to come. I've noted from you and uh, from seeing you online first for however many years I was following you, it was more than five years and then meeting you. And obviously you've changed a lot as everyone does in their 20s. Um, and you've reached a very like mature spot and, and you're very comfortable in your own skin and so forth. Whereas you've also mentioned to me previously, you were maybe more insecure or trying to prove or trying to, you know, all these other things that is normal that when someone in, at the age of 22 has all that money, it's, it's natural. Um, I want to understand because you've mentioned you are an introvert by nature. 
Um, and I've also noticed how you carry yourself, at least in Dubai, which is very, very small circle by design, it seems. But you have a huge network where whenever someone's coming to Dubai, they know you, they hit you up, and then you will you will always give someone time of day to uh, and go for a lunch, go for a dinner. Whether you then stay in touch after is another thing. But I, I wanted to understand, is that an intentional decision of want to have a small circle of people you speak to, but being on social media, therefore everyone trying to get access to you, um, and therefore having a huge network, but a small circle. Is that by design? Is that anything to do with your trading, uh, with the with the ego conflation and so forth? Uh, no, I think it's, you know, my circle has, you know, continuously stayed small and it has actually went smaller year after year. I think this year, last year was the smallest, year prior to that was the smallest until that year, year prior mm. to that was the smallest. Every year it's been cutting more and more people down. And it, it's been like, People that are close to me, I've, I've learned where, number one, if you are close to me, I, I, I want to make sure you're at a certain standard. And it doesn't have to do with money. It doesn't have to do with finance. It doesn't have to do with status. It has to do with how you carry yourself, how you are as an individual. Like I've had people that have been caught up in some real dumb shit, mm -hmm. dumb problems. And I'm like, if I am next to you every day and you are doing so much dumb shit, your bad smell is going to come on me. So hence, you don't respect mine and your relationship understanding what I'm trying to build and you want to be like, you, you, you know what I'm saying? So I have to keep a distance from you. Same thing of people coming and asking for things. Like if someone in a certain circle of mine and I've had people in the past years ask me for stuff like, Hey, can you give me money? For example, that's, that's, that's a real big turnoff because it depends where it's coming from. If you're someone that started a business and is a close friend of mine and you're pushing to be better and mm -hmm. you run into problems, I understand. But if you're someone doing nothing with your life and you have, you come to someone that is pushing and trying to, you know, move forward in life, hey, can I get money? And you're lazy and you're not doing anything. Okay, well, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I want nothing to do with you. I don't care who you are, just stay away. So, you know, the circle wise, that's by design and I'm very comfortable in having very minimal people in my life. Right, just I am so okay with that. I I don't want a lot of people. When I was 23, I actually wanted a lot of people in my life, and then as I got older, I was like, I, I I don't enjoy having tons of people. A few close people that I I can speak to, stay in contact with is fine. Uh, in terms of the network of traders, um, it's primarily because when I see certain traders, I see what they're doing, and they may be doing something the wrong way. Right, let's say running the business, running the brand, whatever. And for me, one of the biggest things when I was 22 was having a mentor and I never had a mentor. I never had a person I can go to, to be like, hey, where am I messing up? So when I see some of them and, and if they reach out to me and they ask me for advice, I'm always willing to give that as long as I know you're willing to take it and, and, and do something with it, yeah. right? If you're just coming and just, I, I think you're BS, you're not actually gonna take the advice seriously, you're not gonna take the time seriously and do anything with it, then absolutely no, mm -hmm. right? So for me, it's, I, th I think it comes more so from that because at 22 or even 23, I was lost. Even at 25, it's certain things I was lost. Like let's say starting Tradezell, I wish I had a person to be like, hey, how do I build this SaaS company, right? Like I remember uh, uh, Alex Becker at 25, uh, I used to watch his stuff, I still do here and there. But I was like, oh, I wish I could reach out to this guy and just have a 30 minute conversation on how we built mm -hmm. Hyros, right? Just something small. And I realized that goes a long way for some people that are trying to build. And I, I don't see where it would hurt ever to help someone give them yeah. 20, 30 minutes. And, you know, and I, al I always believe things get reciprocated one way or another. Yeah, so that, that's something I've noted too, where your, your position in the industry is like, you're, you're very seen, also not seen at the same time. It's a weird uh, thing, but whenever I meet a trader, uh, or your name obviously always will come up, and they've always said, oh yeah, yeah, I spoke to him, he helped me out, whether it's, uh, I mean, literally everyone, whether it's from Kimmel to Paladin to Jesse or whoever, like they're all like, oh yeah, yeah, Umar helped me out with this, Umar gave me this advice. And it seems like y you're supporting everyone, you're, uh, you're pulling everyone up, but also you're kind of also a bit removed. Uh, which for me then posed the question of, do you believe in networking in general? I mean, I don't consider that networking, to be honest. Okay. Um, like all the people, the people you've mentioned and so many other people, I genuinely think they're great people. Just like putting the training aside, I think they're great people. Like Kimball, I ran into me yesterday uh, at the mall, great guy. Um, uh, Paladin, Jesse, Omar, every single person. And and my thing is, I'm always open to whatever experiences I have that you don't have. And if I can help you avoid making those mistakes, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I may need something from you. I may need some help from you, 
you know, same thing goes in that way. So it gets reciprocated in so, so many different ways. And I'm a big believer in just giving and giving and yeah. giving, right? And and give with not without looking for anything in return. I think when you give with looking for something in return, it just it's it doesn't come up pure. It's just not the way. So it's like, hey, you need help with this? Sure, I, I've done this to see where I messed up, to see what worked, to see what didn't work. Here you go, take it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm not really uh I'm not really too I'm not I've never been the pers person where it's like, oh, I'm scared of building a, com a competitor. Oh my God, if I give you opinion on how I'm growing my YouTube or how it worked, I'm scared of you becoming, I don't care. Good mm. luck, I hope you do well. Phenomenal, I, it doesn't bother me. To, to that point, I think I think it's very true that trading the industry is not an or space. It's not like Omar or someone else. Yeah, yeah. It can be and, uh, and you usually collab and amplify each absolutely. other. So it's, it's, it's a benefit for everyone. You know, we've had in, at least in Dubai in, in, in the last year, we've had some adventures of uh, meeting different people, going out for dinners um, and networking outside of the traders uh, space. And I've noticed your approach has always been, uh, you're very calculated, let's say. No, that's the wrong word. You're just more uh, observant. <laughs> Okay. You're more observant. You kind of listen what they have to say. You maybe direct them in a certain way to kind of see what they're about. Why would you know? Why are they saying certain things to you? And then always after we've met someone, we have a bit of a debrief of like, what did you think? What, what did you think? And you're always uh, analyzing of like, he told me this. Why do you think he felt the need to remind me of that or bring this up or mention this small thing? Uh, is that something you've always been like, like very analytical and understanding why people move in the way they do and and. Or is that just, we just have a fun conversation? Yeah, after? no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I always like to analyze people I'm breaking bread with or even meeting in general. Uh, I like to know, I like to know you on a deeper level than what you portray. I think a lot of people that portray something, they have so much more depth behind it. And when I analyze them through conversations, what they share, what they don't share. Like, for example, if you and I have a conversation about cars and you have to remind me of how, many, how much money you made last year, even if you've done well, and I've met people that do extremely well, it comes from, okay, why does this guy feel so insecure? Or why does this person feel insecure that they need to mm. bring this up? It, it also shows you, because I think the biggest flaw humans can have is insecurity. If you get into business with someone, a relationship, friendship, whatever, and they're insecure, that can be a big, big mess down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Because they need to feel that they're doing well or showcase the world that they're doing well. It becomes a big problem. So I, I just like to analyze people. Uh, look at things they're saying, how the conversation's going, and just kind of pay attention to that always. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not something I do actively. It just subconsciously happens. And I, I also, okay. if I don't have anything to add to a conversation, I, I'm like when I was younger, I did. Now I'm like, I have nothing to add. I'm not going to just say things to say things. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And in general, networking outside of the traders space, which you still participate in, do you feel like there's any benefit in it or why, why do you still entertain it? Uh, I mean, I, I, I enjoy meeting people, right? I think mm. especially people that are doing very, very well, I, I would love to sit down and, and talk for an hour or two just to pick up things. Even if you and I are talking about, let's say we're traders, we're not talking about tra trading, we're talking about horses. I can still learn a lot about you just through mm. conversation that I may not learn if we only spoke about trading. Mm. So I think it gives you insights, it gives you ways people look at stuff. I think it's great, but I, I, I've never really been the biggest fan of networking. I've just mm. had a different approach. Not to say networking is bad or you're too good to network with people, absolutely not. Uh, I, I think if you wanna be taken serious, you have to have something to bring to the table. And if you are networking, you can't, like if you're making, I don't know, half a million dollars a year, you can't go to a guy doing a hundred million a year and say, hey, I wanna network with you. Yep. From a respect point of view, you have nothing to offer. I'm not making it an offering or not offering game, but you have to come to you know uh, any sort of game and, and level out the playing field. Even if it's not, what can I offer this person that they don't have or they may need to network with them? And that's the idea of networking with either meeting with people at your level or higher. So you have to kind of you know be able to balance that out. And for me, it's always been, hey, these are things I want to do. Uh, I understand that if I do them exceptionally, exceptionally well and I put all my energy into being the best at this, whoever I want to meet, eventually they will want to meet me. It can mm -hmm. come from an ego standpoint of view yeah. or whatever standpoint of view. For me, it's just been make my position so much more stronger that if I want to meet with this individual, they will eventually want to meet with me instead of me going after them. Not that I won't yeah. or whatnot, but it's just strengthening my position. Let's say 10 years from now, you've come a long way in the last, let's say, decade in your career where 
in, in multiple verticals, whether it's uh, with Stock Market Labs and now Blackline Trading and establishing a floor and uh, all of those ventures, it's within your own personal trading and, and excelling in that. And then it's also now with a SaaS, w with Tradezilla and, and all the complexities that come with that. And it's a, basically a separate industry of tech and SaaS and managing and scaling a team, but it's applied to the trading space. So when you have all these multi multiple verticals, which do all cross over, but they are independent skill sets and independent projects. Um, number one, what are you most passionate about moving forward? Uh, because that's probably going to change and, and maybe already has changed. And let's say 10 years from now, when you're in that networking environment and you've, you've met some, so someone you look up to, what will you want to tell them that you're most proud about? Or wh what would you want to lead with in moving in the, f in the future? I mean, 10 years from now, I, I, I don't know. Like, I can't mentally think 10 years ahead. Okay. I just, I just, I can't do it. I think uh, so many things happen throughout the years that it's hard to think 10 years ahead. At least for me, I, I, I can't. So I don't know about 10 years ahead. Uh, I think the thing I'm most passionate about would be Tradezilla. Uh, the reason is because everyone still thinks we are aiming to be a trading journal, which we're not. That's like phase one, right? Uh, I've said this, I've said this countless times, by mid-2025, maybe end of 2025, we are going to be something completely different. Uh, even now, we've added back testing, we mm -hmm. added replay, we added so many other things where we're evolving from a trading journal, and that's done by design, why we're taking that route, and what we are trying to, to become, which I don't want to share yet, is something way bigger, right? And this is just step one. So that's why I'm, I'm passionate about that, not because, oh my God, it's the trading journal. No, it's what we're aiming to build and what we're trying to become in the trading space. Uh, that has to be, I think, is, is probably where I'm the most passionate with, and I think I will be. And it has nothing to do with money or dollar value. It's just, even if Tradezilla went to a point where in three years I made zero dollars from it, I, I'm okay with that because I'm so yeah. passionate into building the idea, because I think whenever you have any sort of idea or vision in your head and you can make it come to life, I think that to me is like the, the most exciting thing. Mm. I've seen you speak on podcasts before and like uh, the journey of Tradezilla and, and the early days and you, when you had no idea, you were just interviewing other, uh, what's it called, tech providers, just to learn what to ask and that kind of stuff. So we, you've mentioned that before, but how about now, like 2023 and now and 2024 where I just remember, because I see it, the long hours and also the different challenges week to week. Uh, things get delayed, things get pushed back, you hit roadblocks. One thing for me was just crazy when you mentioned that simple feature of night mode where everything's white and then you can turn everything black. It sounds like a quick thing, but then you were like, no, no, it took, I think, two weeks in the end, right? Yeah, it took some time. You know, because so, the thing is you need designs, you need to incorporate the right way, especially if you didn't do it from day one. We didn't do it from day one. so. Mm -hmm with design updates and making the color palette similar and then incorporating it on all the different pages because we're a much more evolved product was way long because I thought it was going to take a day, just something very small. Yeah. But it was like, it takes a few weeks. So now uh, coming into this year, obviously you have like a bigger roadmap for yeah. 25, 2025 and beyond. But let's say by the end of the year, what do you want Tradezilla to have and, and mean to people beyond just a journaling app? I mean, by the end of the year, the, the one of the big features is the uh, Zella AI, which we're working on right now. It's okay, to give cool. you complete feedback. We have so many data sets uh, where if you put in your information, right, you upload your trades, we will be able to give you very accurate information on areas that we think that you need to improve on just right off the bat. That's like the one big core feature. Uh, oh, second okay. is we're trying to incorporate tons of different educational models into it. So much education, all free. Like you don't have to subscribe to TradeZell to get it. It's going to be free for everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, even if you're like, I don't want to join Tradezilla, we believe in the mission of we want to empower traders and we want to help traders become profitable. So we don't want to be like, well, for you to get this education, you need to pay us X amount a month or X amount a year to get it. No, if you don't want to use us, it's fine. You can still use the education. So the education portal, the way we are aiming to build it and how the a AI and the third thing, which that's the third thing I don't want to share just because it gives people a competitive edge and I think that that part is important and I'll tell you off camera but yeah those those would be three things um we added a back testing a very basic back testing but I think to involve that into automated back testing as well where you can put in your strategy and structure it however you want write it out and the AI model can kind of put that into words and kind mm -hmm. of take those trades in a certain time period but like I said every tool we build it comes off with one idea of how do we help the trader 
that's it. You know, and like I said, even now we're not a final finished product. We're far from it. I I still think we're like five percent or ten percent of where we where we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. When when I see Tradezilla forward facing uh, in terms of what you're putting online and content wise, is just a phenomenal tool. People can benefit and and it's uh it's just brilliant. But behind the scenes, I also see the other side, which is the strategic businessman who's calculating moves ahead, chess moves ahead. And then just simple things of like, um, obviously it's doing great business wise, revenue wise, but you're not taking a penny out for yourself uh, yet. And it's been a while. And, and, and then I asked you and you were strategic, you were like, okay, because one day a competitor will come. I need to have a war chest ready to make sure we are the best. And then also keep investing in your team and the best tech to keep growing it. Um, so the, it leads to my question, which is, I think by now you've achieved everything you wanted to financially in terms of you have more than you could probably spend and therefore your generation below also. Um, and you've done cool things, like you just bought your family a house for $4 million. You're, you're doing incredible stuff, the schools in Pakistan that you're building. So now when you've reached that point where you're doing the cool stuff and you've taken care of yourself, are you still financially driven or is it now just no. building uh, and doing cool things? Uh, I, I think I stopped being financially driven from 2020. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think I stopped. I stopped, I think 2020 or 2019 was the last time around then where I've set a financial goal. I've not had a financial end of the year goal okay. since then. Even now, I, I don't have a goal of any monetary number at all. It's all, hey, Tradezilla, we want to build a tool that can help traders become profitable, right? You go to my content, there's a mission behind it. Every video that we make for trading or any video we make at all is for the 18-year-old Umar that is watching or trying to get into trading. So everything has to resonate with that. So any mm. video we make, that's why you'll see my content. There's no fluff. There's no bullshit. There's no, go buy my course, guys. 18-year-old Umar didn't like that. That's not what I want to put out to him. That's not what mm. I want him to watch. I want to give him raw, real value. So everything we have is mission-oriented, right? And I'm a strong believer when you have a strong enough mission in any company, anything you do, the money shows up. Yeah. You don't, I, like, you, even if you don't want it to show up, it's going to come. Like, imagine you go and you're like, I want to be the best trader that can have an 80% win rate, let's just say, with a 3R multiple, whatever the case is. Imagine you hit that. What, what, what will happen? You will make money, simple. Mm. Right? But if you go and you're like, well, I want to make $10 million. Cool. It's not just going to pop up here. Yep. Right? So I, I, I don't set, um, I'm not really driven by money. I know money is a byproduct and that will always drive humans to want more because it's a competitive game. But any any goals I have or anything I set are not around money. I, I also think after after you have a set amount, whatever that number is, and I think everyone has a different number, where it's like, well, I ha I live a very comfortable life at this number. Everything over that is just go crazy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's why with Tradezilla, I think the superpower I have, and someone told me this, is I don't need a dollar from it, and I will not ever really need a dollar from it. So I can mm -hmm. keep pouring money back into it. I can keep letting the war chest build up as much as possible. I don't have to go outside and raise capital. Uh, I don't need, you know, any any partners besides it being family owned and just mm -hmm. growing that 100%. And uh, I think that puts us at a very strong place because there's no need for money out of it. And I think most companies, like, you know, when you have to pull money out and you have to start doing, and, and the other things, mm -hmm. I can pour more money if needed. Yes, yes. So I it mean, it's, it's a yeah. strategic advantage to grow. Yeah. Um, do you think, well, when I look at the people around me in my circle and stuff, uh, there's very few people that I think could hit 100 million, 500 million, a billion. Uh, I think you, you have so much time left in your career and you're already at a, you know, a very, very good position. That billion dollar mark, is that something you have your eyes on as a long term target or? Yeah. And no, actually, I remember now you said, um, I want to be a billionaire, not for the money, more for the rooms it can make me enter, or something I, I, yeah, along I think those lines. It's, you know, when people hear someone say they want to be a billionaire or they want to kind of get there, I think everyone looks at it as like, oh my God, this guy's so full of himself or girl, whatever. They care so much about money. I don't, it's not, it's not about the money. I think it's, it's because when we play business, that's our trophy. That's our, mm. what we're playing. The higher degree we play at, the better we are if you want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And it is a competition at the end of the day. Like when you go to sports, the top athletes are winning rings, winning championships, winning Super Bowls, whatever the case is, right? I think for, for business, having the B mark is that trophy. 
So I think going after it and building after it isn't what I'm directly doing, but when I go into like, hey, we are getting involved in this project or that project, this project has the potential to be worth a billion dollars, mm. right? We see it, it's there, it's possible, right? I'm not actively waking up and saying, I wanna make a billion dollars, but if you are on a, on a train track that is gonna take you potentially to a billion if done correctly, then you can you can see it. So I, with two of the projects that we are working on, I, I can see that happen. Now, will mm. it happen? I don't know. Uh, will I work towards building the company to be at that value? Sure, right? But it's not like, oh my God, I want a billion dollars in cash because right. I can't, you know what I mean? But it's just a byproduct of something you build. The more valuable mm. something is, especially in, in business, the more it's worth. Mm. The, the other thing that we were kind of mentioning off camera was, the idea of what trading will hold in, in someone's life. And right now for me, I'm just as passionate as I was in the beginning. And I think it's because I'm still um, uh, hopeful that I can achieve a lot more, as in I still see a lot more upside in my career. Uh, and I'm also still learning a lot and, and refining and find, you know, th doing the reps. So for me, it's still, I feel like in that curative, creative space, whereas now you're a little bit further. So you've also now, achieve the big milestones financially. So that kind of box or that desire is kind of ticked off. It seems like you're in a very stable place where you have your models, you have your systems and you're not trying to change it too much. So that hope of like how much better can I get is also ticked off. So when you reach that stage of you've been doing it for years at a stable level and you've hit, you know, you've ticked these boxes, do you then also then get kind of it's just repetitive and, and, and monotonous and therefore you want to exit one day? Or is it something that's always going to be a piece of your life, uh, being active in the markets? Oh, I, I have phases of being active in the market. So I, I think that's why I get through with it. Uh, like I'll have two months where I'm a day trader and then I'll have <laughs> two months where I don't even look at what's going on in the markets, right? Uh, but I think with me, it's um, I'm, I'm by design, I've always been very lazy. I'm still very lazy. I know it sounds very, it sounds weird because it's like, how are you lazy? I know I'm very lazy. Uh, where in trading, I'm like, okay, well, this is working. It's refined. How do I make more by doing the least amount of work? Okay, two ways. Find these similar setups that I'm good at. Put in more risk. If I can find that, trade the least amount of days and I can make more money, cool. I, I'm not a fan of doing so much active work. I've learned over the years, activity doesn't always engage in productivity, right? And we True. as humans are wired to think more activity means higher productivity levels. Where I've learned and I've seen it happen firsthand, proper activity in the proper direction and proper things will and always have create more productivity, mm -hmm. right? So it's finding those areas that you can go, okay, well, I have this table. Where can I win on the 80% table? Where can I take 80% of this? I don't care about the other 20% yes, right now. Yeah. Let me take the majority of it. That's a quick win. Mm -hmm. So I, I naturally look for, okay, immediately quick wins. Okay, where's the quick win? Cool, where do I pour money into driving this quick mm -hmm. win? Now I can go into the 20%, but the remaining 20% will require 80, 90% of effort to achieve that. That's when you go to like perfectionist level. But if I can take that 80% of something and put in that minimal effort, not that I'm only putting minimal effort, then imagine what I can do if I do that over and over mm -hmm. and over again. So in trading, it's it just, for me, it comes, it comes down to that. Look at the similar setups that I'm comfortable with. Uh, obviously, you know, go back, back to strategies, go mm -hmm. back, look at what's happening in the market, get comfortable, put in reps, get familiar over and over again. Those things have to be done. But in terms of when I'm in front of a, in front of a screen, if I achieve something in an hour or two, I'm done. I, I'm not going to sit here for another five hours trying to make more. I've, I've gotten my 80%. Okay. And that to me, I think also mentally allows me to be more at ease as a trader than for me to be like, oh, I've traded an hour and I've made 35 grand. Imagine another hour. I'm like, no, it's okay. Okay. I'll walk away. You know That's it. Walk away. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll walk away. I'm good. We, we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast kind of what you've done for the last three, four years in your end of year profits. And I forgot to get the question out of it. Um, so do you, first of all, do you always start off with the same amount or do you just use the profits of the year before or has each year the starting balance grown? No, I've always started with uh, roughly about 200 grand. Actually very small Re relative uh, to your profit yes, at the end. And I'll tell you why. Cause so I trade options very heavily, right? So if I have, my account goes to a million or $2 million, 
it's it, it's very hard for me to trade option contracts with that much capital and find liquidity. I can't get in and out as quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I was trading equities or if I'm trading futures, okay. sure, you know, more money, more profits. But in options, I haven't went more than a thousand or twelve hundred contracts, which is a lot of contracts. If you ask anyone that trades options, a mm. thousand or twelve hundred contracts on a position is a lot, right? And most of the time, that position size equates to two to five hundred grand, depending on date of expiration, okay. depending on you know uh, what what you're trading, the cost of the contract. So two to five hundred grand is like my super max position size. I'm not. I, I'm not going above that. I don't think in the past few years I've went above that on options, right? Mm -hmm. And even when I hit 500K, that's when I'm on a hot streak. I'm comfortable. Uh, the market's in, in movement. I'm putting out size and putting out some good trades. I'll go to that number. But typically some days it's like 60 grand, 80 grand, 70 okay. grand in, in you know, position size. And with options, you're able to generate 30, 40%. So if I am going into a position with 100 grand and I don't have you know, liquidity problems, I don't have problems getting filled, mm. entry, exit, all that stuff. And I can walk away making 20%, I'm good. I, I don't need yeah. to scale heavier than that. So that's when people go, well, okay, well, if you did this much, why aren't you starting next year? And I'm like, I wish I could. I see. Yeah. It's not that I don't want to, I wish I could. I wish I could go into an option contract tomorrow and put in $6 million and get filled without a problem. I mm. can't. That, that's just the nature of options. It's not that much okay. open interest, not much liquidity available. Mm -hmm. So that's why my starting account balance is to a certain degree that I'm like, okay, well, I'm not gonna go more than this. Even when my account goes to, let's say a million or 800 grand or one point, whatever, I take it out. Cause it's just capital sitting being unused. Yeah. I think there's a cool lesson in there too, that you're not just growing an account infinitely no. endlessly for no like you also take it out every year and you have a cutoff date so the reason i i asked all of that was to kind of understand that you've had the ups and downs you start off at a similar point one year is huge and next year is still big but it's not not as um as crazy as the year before so you've had these ebbs and flows in your trading journey over the last few years and you've also matured as a lot of as a person going through your 20s which we've covered and i want to kind of end the podcast on what have you learned each year uh, in in a trading sense, I mean, like at the end of 2020, this was my biggest lesson. 21, this was my biggest lesson and so forth. Because when I look at myself, I definitely have my one major lesson of the year. If I could condense it down, do you have something equivalent? For last year, I still don't have a lesson. I remember someone asked me, uh, I think I think uh, no one asked me uh, a couple of days ago, what was your biggest? I was like, honestly, I don't know. I haven't processed it yet because so much happened from like December till, you know, January. I didn't, I didn't process it. But uh, th there are typical lessons. Um, I usually write down what what it is. Like I, I do like a recap for myself on like the biggest things and whatnot. Uh, I just learned that, you know, ultimately the market is always right in the past few years. As much as you try to justify that the market is overbought, oversold, whatever you want to, you know, put a bias on, the market will do what it wants to do. Right. And I've seen that happen with me countless times where I'm like, well, this market is way too overbought or this particular stock is way, way too overbought. I, you know, it has to go down. OK, it has to go down. But now I have to time it. You know, mm. I have to find the proper entry. There's so many other criteria that go along with it. So it's like, OK, well, unless those things align and make sense, whatever the market is doing is right, because that's how the market is yeah. going to function. So I think taking that away and then the big the second biggest thing is, um, you know, just because you had a, a big year or big month last month or last year does not mean you are going to or you are or the market is going to allow you to have a big year again. Right. It's it's like uh, in one of Drake's uh, song, he goes, do that shit again. Mm. Right. So it's like a, a mentality that I follow with trading and everything again. So it's like that's where when you do get compliments, you do get highs, you do get everything. It's like, well, do it again. Do it okay. again. OK, you had a good year. Great. Doesn't mean you're going to have another seven figure year. Doesn't even mean you're going to have a profitable year. Right. You had a great week. Cool. Reset again. Mm -hmm. and that's trading. And then when you apply that concept to your personal life where you have a bad day and at the end of the day, you hit reset. OK, I had a bad day. Move on. Mm -hmm. It allows you to move with a cleaner slate. And that works in during bad days. And it also benefits you during good days, because when you have a good day and you get ahead of yourself, it's very easy to get comfortable and complacent. But if you reset and you're like, okay, well, for me to achieve what I had yesterday, I have to work twice as hard. It mm. keeps you going and keeps things moving. That lesson that you've just mentioned was actually my, when I have my list, was my lesson from two years ago. It was the idea of that 
I was trying to control the uncontrollable, which is the market. The market is always right. So rather than trying to control that, let me control what are my controllables. And then when I started to understand, these are the things in my control, my win rate, my risk reward, and X, Y, Z. Focus on that and, and uh, not on the market. So that's cool. Uh, but bro, thank you very much. Uh, I think this was a fun one. And I think let's go off for lunch and, and carry on talking. Thank you. Appreciate thank you, you man. Thank you.